You're watching Swipe, coming up on this week's show. Angela speaks to NASA about plans to get humans living on Mars. I look at how Google is bringing the extinct back to life. And we explore the mono world in this week's Games Review. Welcome to Swipe from the Natural History Museum in London. More than five million visitors come here every year. And the reason we're here will become clear a little bit later on. Before then though, life on Earth has its challenges. Dippy could tell you that much. But what about life on Mars? Well, Angela's been speaking to NASA about the tech pushing space exploration boundaries. The idea of living on the red planet may sound like the stuff of Hollywood fantasy, but a top NASA scientist says the premise of the film The Martian could soon become a reality. One of the biggest challenges facing space explorers is having enough supplies of what they need to stay alive and getting it all up there. So I gotta make water and grow food on a planet where nothing grows. However, this problem could be solved through synthetic biology, the process of taking cells into space and growing them to create survival essentials. It costs about $10,000, I guess what that's, you know, these days, 8,000 pounds or whatever, to launch a can of soda into low Earth orbit. And at that point, you only have a can of soda in low Earth orbit, you're not even at Mars. So, up mass, as we call it, is tremendously expensive. So we want to do everything we can to reduce the amount of material that we have to send into space. If you look at the body as a technology, it has a lot of advantages. For starters, it's self-replicating and self-repairing. So the concept with synthetic biology is that you only need to take a tiny number of cells with you to Mars, freeze them and then develop them on site. You have raw materials such as minerals there, you have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you have nitrogen, you have metals and so on, and you use those to feed these cells that then grow and could produce the food or the fuels or the clothing or the medicine for the astronauts. NASA is planning on sending humans to an asteroid by 2025 and Mars in the 2030s. And engineers here at Airbus are among those working with scientists around the world to develop the technologies that astronauts will use to make those difficult missions possible. Airbus's Mars Yard provides a simulated environment to test autonomous rovers, ahead of launching the first European one to Mars in 2020. A fleet of robotic spacecraft are already on the red planet, increasing our knowledge on the difficult conditions humans will have to endure. Some of the biggest challenges for us, especially in my structure design team, which is where I work, uh, is the thermal conditions on Mars. So Mars is generally really cold. It's maybe minus 130 degrees at night, which, you know, really very cold. But even by day, it can be sort of minus 75, which is colder than even kind of military grade Antarctic survival equipment has to go down to. So keeping our electronics warm enough to function is quite a big challenge for us. There's also the challenge of shielding radiation, among many other things. But the good news is there's nothing technologically impossible. It's just a matter of time and money to develop the necessary tools, and synthetic biology is hoping to give astronauts some of those to help them survive. Angela Barnes, Sky News. Stick around for our games review. We've got a title that takes the Tinder approach to managing a medieval kingdom. But first... That's a real Stegosaurus skeleton. Stay with us here at the Natural History Museum because in a moment I'll be finding out how one of tech's biggest names is updating the way people see inside this famous building. That's coming right up after a roundup of this week's tech news. Apple launched its latest operating system for iPhone and iPad, albeit with some users reporting technical problems initially. iOS 10 has a fresh look and changes include being able to get your phone out of sleep mode just by picking it up and sending handwritten messages. Robotics researchers in Florida have been working with a man who's paralyzed in preparation for the world's first ever Cybathlon next month. That's an event where people with physical disabilities use advanced assistive technologies to compete. Here, Mark is practicing for the slalom, controlling a battery-powered exoskeleton that enables him to stand and walk. 
drone racing will be shown on Sky. The broadcaster, which owns Sky News, has invested more than £750,000 into a deal with the Drone Racing League, which will see elite pilots flying hand-built UAVs through complex race courses, culminating in a winner-takes-all championship. The series starts next month. A device that can answer your questions and control appliances in your home is coming to the UK later this month. The Amazon Echo is a smart speaker and virtual assistant that can also build shopping lists and link to other services at your request. YouTube and other video websites will be forced to pay more for music under plans to reform European copyright laws. The European Commission proposals would see artists and record companies get more money from the video sites, while platforms like YouTube and Facebook would also be required to use tech that can track copyright violations. Now let's talk about why we're presenting a future forward tech show from a museum of natural history. Well, it's all down to a partnership between this place and Google. Imagine seeing this on a school trip. Google's arts and culture platform just added the Natural History Museum to its digital experiences. This is the Romeliosaurus at the Natural History Museum. That's swimming in the middle of the corridor. Exactly. <gasps> so the museum to myself, no one else here. Exactly. Apart from a massive Romeliosaurus. Exactly. So why did you guys do this with the Natural History Museum? Well, uh, what we've been doing since 2011 is actually working with museums around the world. We started with art, we did history, we did performing arts, opera, but we hadn't really done natural history. So we started talking to the Natural History Museum. They told us that, you know, it's really about time that we brought these stories to life using technology. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's certainly putting a new spin on school trips. The tail. It was actually like it was real and um, it, this, like, it, I felt like it was going to eat me. You get to learn different things, but in school you just learn the same thing over and over and over again. Pupils don't actually need to be here for the experience. The headsets can be used anywhere. What's in it for us is engagement with a larger audience. Being able to connect with not just the five million people that visit us each year, but with that huge uh, uh, online community uh, is really important to us. Other 360 videos let users walk around the building to different areas, including the tank room. Amazon drainage in South America, a very large freshwater fish. The museum's just one of a number of natural history institutions collaborating with Google. This giraffe -a titan is in Berlin. But I asked one tech expert if he thought tourist attractions are just jumping on the virtual reality bandwagon. I think a lot of them are. I think it has to be done in a clever way, rather than just saying, this is the room that we have, and here you can stand in it and pretend to be it. For me, that's not enough. You know, I see VR very much as, from a classroom experience, as going to the Great Barrier Reef, for example, somewhere where it wouldn't be that easy for me to go to as a child. Great Barrier Reef this isn't, but it could be just as breathtaking. Gemma Morris, Sky News. Time now for this week's games review, including a high concept puzzler. Here's Kate. So recently on my phone, I downloaded a game called Reigns, which is a lot like Tinder, but instead of dating people, you're a medieval monarch trying to make decisions that are basically yes or no most of the time and it's really easy to get wrong. You've got four things along the top, which is uh, your military, your church, your people and your money, and you have to keep those balanced if you get too much or too little of any one of those. You tend to die and that kind of brings your reign to an end. But then you break, wake up and you're the next king, so you can keep going from there. It's a really interesting little game. It's, it's perfect for mobile and it's something you don't need to put much effort into because you're just swiping left and right the entire time, which is, easy enough to do. Recently, the new Ace Attorney came out. It's called Ace Attorney Spirit of Justice. I think it's the sixth in the current series, and it's really interesting with what it does, with what the series is good at. You play a lawyer, a defense lawyer in particular, and you're trying to rescue people who are very clearly innocent, but you have to convince everyone else that they're innocent as well. Uh, the series is normally set in, well, it's set in Japan, but it pretends it's set in America. But in this one, it's set abroad. It's not really clear what the country is meant to be. It's kind of sort of Japan, sort of China, and sort of there's the weird hippie character in it that makes you think that maybe it's set in California after all. 
but it's a really interesting way of revitalizing the series that so far I'm really enjoying. Uh, a couple of the more recent games have sort of seem to flounder with what they're trying to do. If a game is set in court the whole time, there's only so many things you can do before people start to go, well, this is a bit boring. But what this one does is because you're in a foreign country, it goes, OK, the courts are completely different over there. You're going to have to relearn how to be a lawyer. Oh, and by the way, they really hate lawyers in this country, so you're going to have to work twice as hard. And I think that makes it a really interesting game. If you're new to the series, it's hard to get into because there's a lot of references to old games. But for me, I've played every single game in the series so far, and I love it so much. A game that's just come out on consoles last week is a game called Hue. Uh, which is a really clever name for what the game actually does. It's all based around colours. Uh, you wake up and you're this guy called Hugh, as in the name Hugh, but also the colour thing Hugh, which is wordplay. And you, you're getting these letters from your mother who's trapped in some kind of colour-based realm. She kind of implies that maybe she's in the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, so she's technically invisible. And she gives you this, this sort of ring uh, that you fill with colours. And what you do is it's a standard puzzle platformer, but you use the colors to make objects appear and disappear. So let's say you're in a room uh, and everything is blue, but there's an orange block and it's blocking your way. So what you do is you change the color of the background to orange and then the block disappears and you can walk through. And when you're the other side, you can change back to blue and then you can pull and push the orange block to help you climb up to where the door is. It's very clever and it's really well designed as well. It's got this sort of doodly aesthetic to it, all these kind of swirls and little shapes in all the platforms that makes it look unfinished but in a really nice sort of way and it's got this incredible piano soundtrack that's really lovely to listen to and it's actually very difficult in a lot of the levels which led to me feeling very frustrated like I wasn't very good at games but I managed to complete it so maybe I am good at games really. Well, that's it for this week, but don't forget you can watch any of our Swipe episodes on our YouTube playlist. Just type in Sky News Swipe and stay up to date with all the latest tech news throughout the week with Sky News on mobile, tablet, catch up, SkyQ and Snapchat. I'll see you again next week. Bye bye.